Amen. Thank you very much, musicians. Amen. Um, now, I used to know a guy, um, well, it's a guy that we all know and love, that was convinced that I did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And um, no matter what I said or what I preached, I could not convince this individual that I did. Um, it, it, and it was just kind of a dead-end situation. But uh, I do believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that it is the last day provision for the church. But I'll tell you what I do not believe. You do not need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. That's oneness doctrine and it's heresy. Okay? And they get it from Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which when you read that carefully and you actually study it out in the Greek, it's talking about a result of salvation, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's something that takes place after you experience salvation. Okay? It doesn't happen at the exact same time. I've known people, Brother Lance, that got filled with the Holy Ghost when they were down praying to be saved. And it happened at the same time, but it, 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 it doesn't always happen that way. And when somebody genuinely repents of their sins and becomes converted to Christ, if they would die the minute after they do it, they go straight to heaven. Amen. Now, I want to thank everybody here. Uh, as your pastor, I'm, I'm very, very proud of everybody that went out on the Fair Parade Outreach. I, I'm very proud of Brother and Sister Martin when she came up and said that they were praying for us, that God would move, and they went out and witnessed, you know, at a different place. And we didn't necessarily expect them to walk from Linway Plaza all the way out to the fairgrounds, right? Amen. But they wanted to be a part, and they went and did what they could do, and we appreciate that. But, folks, I want you to know I really appreciate everybody that was involved in that outreach. Because when that outreach comes around, I get fired up every year and it seems like I get fired up in two different ways. One of them is positive. Well, both are positive, but the other one might seem a little negative. Okay, the way that I get fired up in a positive way is because we have such a potential to reach that many thousands of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just an awesome experience. I mean, how many tracts did we hand out, uh, Sister Shears? Over 10,000, right? I mean, it, what other day, Brother DeBoard, can we go out and accomplish something like that? I mean, so I get fired up, and I get fired up for a multitude of different reasons just under that one reason. Because I like doing it, okay? And I realize I pull the thing, but I do that because I'm the pastor, okay? But I like to see people that have never gone out and hand out tracts before get all excited because they see, hey, this really isn't all that hard. I like to see the look on people's faces, you know, when they, they grab them and they start reading them. And I think, yeah, you just go ahead and read that thing because you don't understand the potential of what you are holding inside of your hands. But I get fired up in what some people might call a negative way, too. And that's I get excited um, and get fired up about when I see all these different big churches that we have in our community. And... Um, they see the exact same potential for that day that I do, you know, if they have a spiritual bone in their body. And uh, when you go up and ask them what they're planning on doing, what they're doing is handing out iPods, you know, because they got that kind of money to do that because they've got this big old fancy church. Or they're handing out T-shirts or bracelets. They were handing out free concert tickets. On their float, they were playing secular music. Okay. Now, and you guys know I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean spirited or anything like that. I mean, I want you to believe, but I get fired up over that because of the potential of what they have to do too. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I want to pray. I want to preach to you for a little while on the right type of work and the right type of worker, because that's very, very important to God. And I want to make sure I felt, man, I wanted to preach this this morning and the Lord wouldn't let me, but I'm glad that He's going to let me pe preach it now. And I'm, again, I'm not feeling good, but maybe it'll be easier to, you know, just get into it and not feel, we'll just see what happens. But uh, I'd really appreciate it. Brother G. if you'd pray over the service. <sighs> Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. The right type of work and the right type of worker. You can be seated. Okay. Now, here's the text we're going to use tonight. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, 
It says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Okay? Now that text is making two things very, very clear. The first thing that it's making very clear is that there is a tremendous work that needs to be done in this world. Amen? And then people are lost, folks. And then when you go outside these doors, the kind of people that you're going to run into are people that are deceived by the devil. They're lost. They're dying. They're on their way to a devil's hell. Because Satan's work in this world and in their lives is both fruitful and it's flourishing. And if that doesn't constitute for a tremendous work that needs to be done in this world, then I don't know what in the world does. So it's obvious. The Lord's saying, listen, the harvest is great. So there's a work that needs to be done. Then the second thing it's making very clear is the fact that God wants to use us as His people to accomplish the work that needs to be done and to combat everything that the devil is trying to do in this world. For instance, notice what we're told in the following verses. I'm going to read our text again. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Then the Lord said in Matthew chapter 28 verse 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Then in Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30, he says, And I sought for a man among them. That's God speaking about the nation of Israel, His people, His church, so to speak, that they should make up a hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. So if there's one thing that the Word of God makes crystal clear, it's the fact that God has a work that He wants to see done, Brother Keplinger, and He wants to use His people to go out and do it. Amen. Amen. Now, all of those verses that I just read make it more than obvious that God has a work for His church to do. Meaning that he wants to see his people reach the lost, defeat the works of the devil, and in turn, further the kingdom of God in the process. That's what he wants to see take place. And so it's obvious that there is a work that needs to be done, and it's also very obvious who in the world he's expecting to go out and do it, isn't it? But something that we also need to see and recognize and understand is the fact that God is not just interested in the work that's at hand. Now, he is, don't get me wrong, but he's also just as interested in the worker that sets out to do it. For instance, notice what Jesus told his disciples after he made mention of the work that he wanted to see them accomplish in the book of Luke chapter 24. In verses 46 through 48, it says this, And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. There's the work He wants to see done. Notice what He says now in verse 29. And behold, I send the promise of My Father unto you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Now, in verses 46 through 48, we see Him declaring very clearly the work that He wants to see done. He wants His people to go out and to reach this world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. But then in verse 49, we see Him switching His focus to the type of worker that He's going to use to accomplish that work. So we see that He's not just concerned with the task at hand, so to speak, but He's also just as concerned with the type of person that's going to set out to do it. Because while He did say that He wanted repentance and remission of sin to be preached in His name to every nation, He also said that the person that was going to be doing that preaching would be required to meet some very, very important qualifications. And when you study out the rest of the Word of God, you'll see that there's quite a list of qualifications that He expects them to meet. Very important. We need to understand that that particular aspect of working for God is more important than we could possibly imagine. But here's what the sad thing is. The sad thing is, is that the modern church, okay, 
seems to be blatantly ignoring this crucial aspect of their commission or their call. To the place where they take full notice that there's a work to be done. I mean, that's what they claim. There's a work that we need to go out to do. But they don't seem to be paying any attention at all on the worker or on how God expects them to go out and do it. Or really on what God expects them to do in the first place. Does that make sense to you? I mean, brothers, y'all, they say, yeah, there's a work and we're going to go out and do it. But they don't know what the qualifications for ministry are, the kind of person God's really going to use. They don't know how they're supposed to go out and do it because they don't even know what they're supposed to be doing and their actions prove it. And because of that, everything that God wants to see done and everything that they are setting out to do isn't having the dramatic spiritual impact that either one of those groups desire it to have. Has an iPod ever changed your life? I mean, here, let's read in the book of Acts. Okay, and the the gates come down, the jailer runs in and says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Uh, Here, I just went down to the Apple store. You go ahead and take this iPod, son. You're going to be all right now. It It doesn't read like that, does it? Now, things are being accomplished... But it's not having a spiritual impact. Huh, that felt good. I'm going to say it again. All kinds of stuff's being accomplished by these folks. But nothing is being accomplished in the spiritual realm, at least on the good side of things. And the main way that they seem to be going out and doing this is by trying to overlook all of the things that the Bible mentions concerning the qualifications that somebody should meet when they want to go out and do a work for the Lord, and they're trying to replace all those things with nothing more than a bunch of man-made schemes and programs that they hope are going to make up for those things somehow. I mean, they don't know what they're really supposed to be doing. They don't have any idea of the work and how you're supposed to accomplish it, the power you're going to need. They don't understand what they're even really up against. So they say, you know what? We'll just come up with some kind of program. And they trade ten nights in the upper room for 40 stupid days of purpose at somebody's small group meeting. And it ain't making the difference that they think that it's making. Amen. Glory to God, Brother Dement. You you amen me real loud. We're preachers. Somebody get behind me here because it's true. I've got news for them. It is not working. This new mindset of ministry that, you know, let's just go ahead and, and do it this way. It's not working. It's not having a spiritual impact on people. But all their attempt to place all their attention on the work while neglecting in full to put any attention at all on the worker is doing, is proving the great, the great quote by E.M. Bounds to be true. He said this, God's not interested in better methods. He's interested in better men. Let, let me put that in modern vernacular. He doesn't need to resort to changing his methods to go out handing free concert tickets and stupid iPods in order to regenerate somebody by the power of the Holy Ghost. He still wants to use the gospel to do that. Here's an old OBI song I used to listen to all the time. It says, My friends, no matter what you have heard, the old weapons still work. And you want to know what God's looking for? He's just looking for somebody that knows how to use those old weapons and that's willing to put them to use. That's the only thing he's interested in. Now, when it comes to the qualifications that the Lord requires of a person that really wants to do a work for him, the life of Elijah gives us a perfect outline of some of the essential things that he's looking for in a a person. Because if there was ever a man who not only accomplished great things for God and was used by God to do a tremendous work, it was him. And he also demonstrated all of these qualifications that the Lord's looking for in an individual's life. And while we're not going to get into all of them, we're going to look at one thing in particular tonight that's very important. And I hope everybody, I already scanned the crowd. Everybody here can handle this message, and you're all probably going to agree with it. Okay, I'm not trying to offend anybody. But in this message, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at one particular thing that Elijah demonstrated in his life when it comes to the qualifications that the Lord is looking for in a person's life that wants to go out and do a real work for him. 
Okay? And that is the fact that Elijah was a man that had an extremely solid understanding of the Word of God. Now, if you were here on Wednesday nights, you'd know that we'd been studying through the life of Elijah, and that was one of our first studies. We talked about four of the different qualifications that made him the man that God could go out and use in the way that he did. And one of the first things we talked about was the fact that he was a man that was studied up in the Word of God and had an extreme understanding of the Word of God. But what that caused him to do is it caused him to also have an understanding of what God was wanting to do in this world as far as the work was concerned. And how he should go about doing it. I mean, he didn't just say, there's a work that needs to be done. I think I'll go out and do it. I mean, he knew there was a work because he read it in this book. And he knew how to do it because he read it in this book. And that made a tremendous difference in what he was trying to do. Okay, now one of the most significant qualifying factors that caused God to use Elijah in such a mighty way when it came to the work that God was going to use him to do was, like I said, the fact that Elijah was a man that was thoroughly studied up in the Word of God. Meaning that he had a thorough understanding of the doctrines of the Bible. Because when you study the Word of God, it's very easy to see that Elijah knew his Bible extremely well. Okay, and there's multiple different places we can see that proves that. But one of the ways that we know that is because of the judgment that he proclaimed upon Ahab and the nation of Israel. Okay, if you remember that, in 1 Kings chapter 17, it says this, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the reason that this verse proves that he had a solid understanding of the Word of God is because that proclamation of judgment is a direct reference to something that he had studied out of the Bible. Notice what he said. He studied this earlier, obviously, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. God said to the nation of Israel, the same people that Elijah was talking to, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, which is exactly what the nation of Israel was doing in the day of Elijah. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and the land yield not her fruit. So in other words, what God's saying is, listen, I am telling you people that if you turn away from serving me and you start following after idols, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cause the heavens to be shut to where you don't receive any rain whatsoever and you're going to have a famine and a drought as a result until you change your ways and get right. So when Elijah went up to him, that's exactly what he proclaimed to him. So it's obvious what the Word of God had to say was the driving force behind the work that Elijah was setting out to accomplish. It was his motivation. I mean, he was living in that land, and, and he was thinking, man, things are getting really bad. And one day in his devotions, now I don't have Scripture for this, but it had to happen some way. One day in his devotion, he read there in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 17, he says, wait a second, that's what's, that's what's going on right now. And God said that if that took place, this is what He wanted to see happen. In a, I'm a man of God. So I'm going to start praying and ask God if, if, if He wants to see this accomplished now. So I believe He started praying, Brother Loomis, and said, God, you know what? It's obvious that that's the way that you feel about this. I mean, that's the judgment that you won't proclaim. That's the consequence that you want to use to try to get them to turn from their wicked ways. Lord, do you want to use me to go before Ahab and save this? Now, it wasn't because he was excited to go and do it. I mean, if you were here for that study, man, he was scared to death probably to go and do that. It meant certain death to walk into the king's presence unannounced, let alone go up and say, guess what, buddy, here's your judgment. But because he'd studied the Word of God, amen, he understood that what God had said in His Word is what he was to go out and be willing to accomplish in his work. In other words, when you're an actor, you get a script, and you just act out whatever it says on that script. Well, when it came to Elijah doing a work for God, he just read through Deuteronomy and came to those verses and he just acted out that in his life. He used Scripture as his script. So it's very clear he understood what the work was God wanted done. And he understood how he wanted it to be accomplished. 
And the reason that that point is so important to make is because it's time that the modern church gets a hold of the fact that a person cannot be used to do a tremendous work for God if they don't even know His Word well enough to even know what He wants to see done in this world, let alone how to go about doing it. Doesn't even make sense. I mean, if you don't understand what somebody wants, how could you go out and do it? But that's exactly what the church world today is setting out to do, folks. Amen? They're trying to accomplish a work that has absolutely no biblical backing behind it at all, which is to build a great big mega church, amen, that will rival, you know, Rick Warren's or Joel Osteen's, fill it full to capacity where there's standing room only and they got to have, you know, multiple, multiple services on Sunday morning to accommodate the crowds and have the cops come and direct traffic so they can get out. I mean, we got a lot of churches like that around here, if you've noticed. Because that's the model of the modern church. How do you know if you're succeeding spiritually? Well, how many folks... I just ran into a person... First thing they asked me was this, how many people you got going to your church? Well, what does that have to do with anything? But they're failing to understand that God is not only interested in the number of people that's in attendance. He is. He wants everybody to be saved. But He's more interested in the spiritual condition of those people that are standing within that body of believers. Because I've got news for them. Standing inside of a church does not make you a Christian any more than standing in a stupid garage makes you a car. But that's basically the gospel that they preach. Now, I realize that that is the modern motto of the gospel message that they present to people. Here's what it is. Just come as you are. We will accept you. God will accept you. Everybody and everything will accept you. Just come as you are. And as a matter of fact, the only thing that you've got to do is just come down and ask forgiveness. You know, which sounds good to people because they come in and they realize they got sin in their life. I mean, they think they're coming to the right place for the answer, Sister Piper. They're coming to a church. They're talking to the preacher and he stands and says, all you got to do is he reads a verse, you know, just, just believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and ask forgiveness for your sins and read John 3.16 and, and you're saved. Everything's great. Now come to our church so we can get your tithe. But the fact of the matter is, that's not the real conditions for what the Bible says a person has to meet in, in order for, you know, real salvation that the Bible talks about to actually be experienced. As a matter of fact... In all actuality, all their message really is, is nothing more than a sickening, putrid, watered-down, pathetic, misconceived gospel that is deceitful and a damnable heresy. That's all that it is. You might say, well, man, you're being mean. What do you think about a person that has the opportunity to have all those people come into their church and they say that what you've got to do to be saved is you just simply have to just ask forgiveness for your sins and and, and that's all you've got to do and just believe that Jesus died for you and you're all right? Because that's not all the Bible teaches us, folks. I mean, I've got videos of some of these big wigs, you know, in the, you know, this modern church movement. You know, and what they do is they go around and they're sitting there talking. And I had Larry King ask one of these bozos, you know, do you think that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? He says, well, Larry, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that. You know, I'm not the judge and it's not my place. I'm just going to leave that up to the Lord. Do you want to know what I would say if Larry King asked me that question? I would say, Larry, by all means... There is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. Peter said there is no other name that we can call on in order to be saved. The Bible makes it very clear. So why is this jelly-spined sissy freak sitting on national television and telling people that? And because he's got books in Walmart, he sure must be right and know what to do. So you know what? Maybe I can follow Buddha too and still make it. Do you think it was an accident that he was on that show and they asked him that question and he gave that answer? Seriously. And just because the church leaders that hold to this modern philosophy of ministry might have thousands of people standing inside their buildings on a Sunday morning, that still does not make their building a church and it still doesn't make the people that are standing in it Christians, folks. 
Okay? Because God is not just interested in what we claim. He's interested in two very specific things that need to come afterward. Our character and our conduct. And if those things don't match up with what we're claiming to be, then God is not interested in anything that we have to say. I mean, after all, Jesus said that He was coming back for a glorious church that was pure and without blemish. Not just a church that was packed to capacity. Amen? I mean, it says that He's returning for a church that was genuinely saved by the blood of the Lamb. Not just for a church that didn't have any empty seats. That's not what it says. That's not the gospel, folks. So here's what the modern church and their new mindset of ministry needs to understand when it comes to the work that God really does want to see accomplished in this world. He doesn't just want us to build a church that's full of people that take on this new age concept of what ministry is. But He wants us to build a church where the people who make it up are genuinely saved and want to go out and do the work that the Word of God says that He wants them to do. And He wants to make sure that the basis of their faith is true repentance, that they're striving to live a holy life because they really have repented, and that those biblical beliefs that they hold are what they're propagating and preaching to other people. And if they're not willing to do that, He doesn't want them to go out and work for them. And the reason why is because those things, if, the, if they're not, if those essential things aren't in place, then God is not going to use the people that are going out to do that work in the first place. And you want to know why? This is a good quote. You might want to write it down. If God can't use you as an example, then He's not going to use you in ministry. It's not going to happen. Because the only way that a person can possibly have the authority that they're going to need to do that work is by knowing their Bible. Why? Because this is our only authority. It's the only way that we even have an understanding of the work that God wants to see done. It's the only way that we can possibly understand how He wants us to go about it. And the only way that we can have the anointing that we're going to need is if we are following the Word of God and we're seeking to fulfill it in our own personal lives. That's the only way that He's going to use us. So here's the thought that I'd like to pose to everybody that is entertaining the modern church mindset. If the people that believe that way would ever take the time to read their Bibles in depth instead of just skimming them on the surface or neglecting to read them so that they can read 40 days of purpose, or the purpose-driven life, or whatever it's called. If, 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 if they would ever read the Word of God, they'd already know this stuff. They'd already know. I mean, they wouldn't be guilty of wasting their time and deceiving people's souls with their watered-down, undoctrinal, false religion, which is what it is. As a matter of fact, they might actually start to go out and win real converts to Christ that in turn could go out and win other people. They could bring them inside their church and they could disciple them. I mean, after all, they're already willing to go out and do a work. I mean, if they would just do it in the right way and do the right work, man, who knows what those people might be able to accomplish rather than simply going out and making false converts that only confuse people in the process. Notice what I just said. They get these people, and as a matter of fact, I knew a guy that was as messed up as you could get. He moved out to Seattle. He got addicted to heroin. He almost overdosed. He was in the hospital for a long time. I believe they had to give him a blood transfusion just to get him back to normal. I mean, he was a wreck. I mean, he had a lot of trouble. Well, he, I, I saw him one day. I didn't even know he was back in town, and I saw him down at Kroger's one time. And he said, hey, man, you know, what are you up to? And I said, well, actually, I'm the youth pastor down at First Assembly of God. And he goes, what? I can't believe that. And I said, well, yeah. He goes, you're not going to believe this, but I got saved too. I said, you did? I said, yeah. And I said, where are you going to church? And he told me where he was going. And I thought, well, man, he really, you know, I hope he's really getting a hold of it. And then I saw him, you know, driving down the street in his truck, you know, smoking a cigarette and, You know, seen him since then doing things that I find real questionable about somebody that was really regenerated like we talked about this morning. You know, I was in one of these big churches one time. I went to an Easter play and I was with a specific individual that that came up to me and he said, you know, hey man, I I feel like I need to go down. You know, they were calling him down and I said, well, you know, I can talk to you. No, I I need to go down. Well, I went down with him because that's what you ought to do. I mean, you ought to try to make him feel comfortable. And I went down and he went up, Brother Prysock, to some of those elders in the church. And he says, well, what do I need to do? 
goes, well, just, just go ahead and come back to the church. You know, we're having church next Sunday, and we'd love to have you, and just go ahead and come. He was there saying, what do I need to do to be saved? Oh, just go ahead and come to the church. Make sure you bring your 20 bucks with you. Think of the opportunity they had right in front of their face. An elder, and that'd be like somebody coming up to Brother Price. Like, hey, brother, you know, I'm being really convicted of my sin. You know, sir, what must I do to be saved? Well, you know, it's good to have you tonight. Why don't you come to church next week? You're more than welcome here any time. Glory to God. I can't help but to be fired up over this nonsense, folks. Again, I'm not trying to be mean, but folks, we need to understand. Here, here's, here's a really good quote that I heard uh, Brother Taylor say one time. He said, there is nothing quite so unbecoming as that of a living contradiction. There is nothing quite so unstinking becoming as that of a living contradiction. And did you know that it's not us old-fashioned holiness nuts that we're the only people that feel that way? But did you know that the overwhelming majority of lost people feel that way too? You say, well, Pastor, I don't know about that. What's their greatest complaint against the church? All the hypocrites. Who's making them? (laughs) I'm tempted to start saying the names. Sister, if you go ahead and come. Listen, if you want to do a work for God, then you have to know what His Word says about the work He wants to have done. And the reason why is because you'll only know what He wants and how He wants it done, and you'll only have the authority and the anointing that you're going to need to accomplish it if you've read the Word of God and you're simply using it as a script to go out and perform your actions. That's the only way. And I want everybody to understand, I'm not trying to be mean-spirited. Okay? And I'm sure not trying to say that we're the only church that's going to make it to heaven. I'm not saying that. I don't believe that way, folks. Okay? But I am saying that God has warned us very specifically and very emphatically that in the last days, this is the kind of thing that was going to take place. And I want you to understand what He had to say about this kind of stuff and the people who went out and did it. He said that there were going to be people that would prefer deception over real doctrine. And he also said that they would promote the very same thing. Take notice of how strongly he made sure that this issue was dealt with multiple times in the Word of God. I've just picked three of them. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Again, do you think I'm being hard? I want you to see how God put it. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, Then in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrine of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Doesn't sound real favorable, does it? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom... Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrines. Talking about the correct kind. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables, fairy tales, kitty stories. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, you make full proof of your ministry. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. I mean, if you would go into a lot of the modern churches and you would preach on obeying your parents, you want to know what they'd do? They wouldn't even listen to you. I mean, that would be a joke. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. They're old fashioned. You don't need to do all that stuff. Traitors. Man, that's a good word. Heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And what does it say to do? From such, turn away. Don't have anything to do with them. 
Matter of fact, the only thing it said that we should do with them is rebuke them so that they could be sound in the faith or have the opportunity to become that way. And we're also told two very severe consequences that this kind of mindset towards ministry is apt to produce. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Then in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Then it says in 1 John chapter 2, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And then here's what really gets me upset. And no, Nobody thinks I'm being mean, do you? I mean, I hope you're upset about this kind of thing, too. Here's, here's what really gets me, Brother Boyer. In Romans chapter 2, verse 24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. In other words, they look at the church, and, or the supposed church, and they're saying, well, look, look what they're doing. I mean, they, there's no change to take place. God's a joke. He must not even be real. I mean, I remember that one guy on the Way of the Master program. Uh, Cameron was sitting there talking about a guy that tried to experience salvation. And he said, but, you know, I didn't see any change in the people around me, so I just gave up because I figured, you know, God must not be real. That's how people feel. God is being blasphemed because of their actions and their claims towards Christianity. That's why I'm fired up about it. Now, those verses are pretty serious, aren't they? And we need to make sure that as the people of God, we take them that way. And here's why. Because I preach this message for two reasons. Number one, I don't want to see anybody become discouraged by the supposed success that they have when they go out and they do the exact same thing that we're trying to do on the exact same day in the exact same kind of ministry. Because it can get discouraging. Matter of fact, when we were pulling out, we started going down just Lincoln as soon as we got out of the parking lot. And I looked, and there was a sea of of people in the same color to shirts. And I knew where they were from and all those things. And I thought, man, how did they get all those people? You know, what's the deal? You know, I can't even get people to show up on Wednesday night, Sister Kincaid. I mean, how in the world did they got all... I heard one time a particular church took in 60000 forsaken dollars during one offering at one of their services. That's a lot of folks giving a lot of money. Think what real Christians could do with that as far as real ministry is concerned. There'd be no reason that, you know, some of these missionaries that have to come and beg for money, but these churches just want to give them $30 a piece. I mean, they have to stay in the United States and take stupid short-term mission trips. They wouldn't have to live like that. Presley would already be in Germany. Akers and his whole crew would already be stationed where they were wanting to go. Because they'd have the sufficient funds to do it. So I don't want anybody to get discouraged because we need to understand that even though they have a success in what they're trying to do, which is to get people to come to their church and nothing more, it's a false success. And the reason I say that, because that's the only thing that a false message can bring. Now, let me make this real clear because you're all looking at me like I'm the meanest person in the world and you're going to vote me out instead of take up the, you know, the kids' crusade thing. Well, you don't understand what I... I feel terrible for the poor people that go in there and, and, and are told all you've got to do is ask forgiveness and just start coming to the church and get part of the programs and, and start handing out you know, donuts on the uh, you know, four-way stop and everything's going to be fine. I feel bad for people like that because they come seeking, what does God want from my life? And they're told by people they should be able to listen to. So, to a certain extent, I blame them because they got a Bible. They could read it. It's kind of like the Catholic Church. When you're not encouraged to, you probably ain't going to. Because what happens when you start doing it and you're not really converted? You start seeing things that God starts putting His fingers on and, I don't want nothing to do with that. And when you're not really regenerated, you don't have a divine nature in you that gravitates towards wanting to do... Is this making sense to you doctrinally? The second thing, second reason I'm, I'm preaching this is because I sure don't want to see anybody buy into this stupid, pathetic, new modern ministry mindset that we don't need to just go out with a good old-fashioned gospel message, hand out tracts, preach on the street corner, go and knock on doors. We don't need to do that. I and mean, then what we need to do is come up with some new kind of program because that's the only thing that's going to work in the day and hour that we live in. 
you know what light for the lost does? I mean, we can't hardly get it flying anymore. But, I mean, we've had it here and stuff before. They hand out literature. Missionaries, they gather missionary literature so they can hand it out when they're out on the field. I was talking to a particular pastor one time at a very big Assembly of God church. And I said, hey, you know, we're trying to set up some different light for the lost meetings. You know, we'd really like to come to your church. And you want to know what he told me? Oh, we're not interested. I said, well, man, you know, there's a lot of people saying that. You know, what's the deal? I mean, did you have a bad experience? Uh, He goes, no, that's just not cutting edge. You know, that's not going to get people in. We're not. The gospel's not cutting edge. I thought it was sharper than any two-edged sword. It's not cutting edge enough to have somebody come in and just tell them, hey, this is our burden to go out and reach the lost and fulfill the Great Commission. And we're going to need materials to do it. Would you please help us? That's not cutting edge. But you want to know what would have happened? If I would have had a bunch of fairy looking people, you know, with guys have their long hair and their little sissy guitars, and they come up there and we'd have some band playing some, you know, kumbaya music and all these different things. And then I'd get up there and say, well, Jesus loves you. And while I think it's the preferred way for you to go to heaven, you just do whatever you want to, y'all. You just do you whatever way you think is best to get into the kingdom of God. Y'all go ahead and do that. And, and you know, I'm not the judge. I'm just a stinking reprobate heretic is what I am. You want to know what that guy would do? It's all, oh, man, go ahead and come out, man. You're going to have him come in. We'll pack this place out. Just think of all the new people that will start coming. Our attendance will skyrocket. Here's the motto and the message that I'm trying to exhort you that this church is going to stick to. Here's the motto. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Because I want you to understand, multitudes of Assembly of God churches are going this way. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition or unto sin, which is what it is. But we are of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. And here's the message we're going to stick with. Found in Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I want you to understand I'm not jealous, nor am I intimidated by some kind of going out and preaching some false kind of message. And I don't care how many people end up going to their church. The only thing my heart does is breaks for the people that are going because they could be hearing the real gospel message. And my heart's really going to be crying out for these men who hopefully don't know what they're doing and are deceiving these people into thinking that they're in right standing with God. But when God calls us and we stand before Him, it doesn't matter if we were deceived and we said, well, wait a second, that church said all I had to do was this. That's not going to matter. He said that you had to repent and become converted. Live a holy lifestyle or you were not going to get in. My heart breaks for those people. And if I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to criticize them, then I also need to be praying for them, folks. But more importantly, I, listen, I know nobody's going to nod, but I know, I've had several people, I, I've overheard things that they were saying. Okay? And, and it's kind of like this kind of mindset starting to go around. Well, you know, maybe, you know, the things they do over there ain't, ain't that big of a deal because they're accomplishing something. I mean, they're, they're winning people. They're not winning anyone. They're getting people to come to their church or to accept their gifts and all these different... They're not being one to Jesus Christ because they're not getting the gospel. Don't think, man, I better switch churches, and that's not my reason for preaching this. Or, man, I better start doing things a different way, and if we don't, man, Pastor, you've got to get with the program. I mean, this is 2011. I'm going to go with the old weapons, and you want to know why? Because they still work. God is not looking for better methods. He's looking for better men. So I want to be just like Isaiah. Who you want to send, Lord? Here am I. Send me. I'll do the work that you said you wanted to have done. I'll do it the way that you said you wanted it to be done. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to be try to be used of God to accomplish it to the best of my ability. 
Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Now, I don't know if you're here and you've been entertaining those kind of thoughts. Um, I hope you're not offended like I was targeting you. I, I, I can't really say anybody specific by, by name or anything like that. But I, I just want you to understand. You, you don't need to change anything. He said, I'm God. I change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same way that people are, are going to go out and get saved by preaching the gospel is the same way that they're going to do it today. And just because, you know, uh, we, we might see all these little, you know, so-called success stories, you know, friend, we're out to do one thing, and that is to give people the true gospel message. That, that's it. When we stand before God, I mean, are we going to have blood on our hands if we went out and gave them a track? What about if they didn't read it? It's their problem. I don't mean that unsympathetically. That's their problem. But if all I do is go and hand him a concert ticket and say, hey, man, you know what? You ought to come and worship with us tonight. And then, you know, let's go out there and you can come to our church sometime. Am I still going to have blood on my hands? Yes, because the gospel wasn't even mentioned. Oh, man, folks, this is serious. We are living in the last days and our Savior stressed this to us so emphatically. Listen, don't fall for this nonsense. Turn away from that kind of stuff. Don't want anything to do with it. As a matter of fact, rebuke them to their face so that they might have the opportunity to be able to understand their folly and turn to Christ themselves. Well, I'll just repeat myself all night long, folks. Don't fall for that nonsense. Amen. We're doing things the right way. Amen. If that pew never gets full... When the rapture takes place, all the rest of us are still going to go if we're living right. If we still only have one service on Sunday afternoon and our parking lot isn't even full, let alone have cops have to direct traffic to get out of here, you want to know what's going to happen when we die? We're going to go to heaven regardless of how many people. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, we ask that You would help us not to fall to the deception of what this worldly mindset that modern church ministry has been diminished down to. But Lord, help us to understand that the old ways still work. Help us to cling to that and realize that we don't need to change things other than becoming more and more consecrated to the commission that You've placed upon our lives. And You said if we would go out with the Gospel message, that all power would be given to us and we would be able to make a difference in this world. Lord, we're praying that You would come and prove the right Gospel message to be the true Gospel message and the most effective Gospel message. Lord, I pray that You'd come and just give a burden on our hearts to not even be interested, let alone even begin to entertain those kind of thoughts that this this worldly church is trying to push on us. God, people even within our own denomination are falling for this by the droves. God, help us never to go that direction. And we'll thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. You know, it would be tacky, but what I'm tempted to do is to start naming churches that you know of and pastors that you know of that have lost the true old-time way and started going after this, and they get more people coming. And what they'll say is, see, who's God for, me or you? And I'll ask them, well, you know, how do you know God's for you? Well, it's obvious. Look how He's blessing my ministry. But is your ministry based off the book? Well, I mean, I'm talking about, look at God. It's got to be for it, because look at how He's blessing me. Who says He's blessing it? Couldn't there be another entity involved in blessing that particular kind of word? Well, I better stop. I'm just going to get myself in more trouble. Let's come down and pray. Glory to God.